Cokesbury Church, how are you doing? I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Hey, I'm Paul. I'm on the worship team here at Cokesbury, and we're doing something different today. Uh, we've come into my studio. Uh, we've kind of gathered up. We're going to do an acoustic set, and we've got Emery Noel with us, some friends of ours. Say hello to them, guys. I'm so glad you were here. Listen, I hollered out at Emery. I said, hey, man, we want to do some new tunes. Uh, you know, turn us on to some new songs. And so Emery made some great suggestions. And so these are some tunes that you're going to start doing at your church as well. How are you? How's your church doing? Tell us about it. Uh, we're doing well. We've been going, uh, we've been back in the building for two weeks, two Sundays. And uh, so as everyone, we're still trying to navigate and figure it all out. But things are going well. Well, I'm so grateful that you guys have joined us. And I'm so excited about this. Noel, it's great to meet you. Uh, this first tune, we've done this before, but man, this is a killer version. This is gone. Let's do it. One, two, three. It wasn't for nothing that you shed your blood. I'm gonna live like my shame is gone Yeah, man I won't be shackled to the way I was I'm gonna live like my chains are gone I'm so pumped about this song. I didn't know this until you shared this with us. Uh, man, this is a great tune. I'm so excited for everybody hears this. This is called Promises by Maverick City, right? Yep. Yeah, let's do this. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant. 
faithful promises Time and time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faith Though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And then my heart will when you speak a word.
Hey, I'm Ashley. We're so glad you decided to join us for worship today. We know there are a lot of places you could have been, and we're really appreciative that you're spending some time with us. We've got two things we want to invite you to that are coming up really soon. First is this coming Sunday, July the 5th, we're gonna get to worship together in person. We'll have our normal worship schedule in the morning, and then in the evening at 6 p.m., we'll gather in the parking lot on the North Campus. Bring your lawn chair, bring your camp chair. We're gonna sit six feet apart, we're gonna wear our masks, but we're gonna be together, and we're so excited about that. We'll have communion, we'll be collecting items for Wesley House. You can check the comments to see the list of things that they need. We'll also be taking up an offering for the Bob Lewis Fund, which helps us to meet emergency needs of our friends in our community. We really, really, really hope that you'll join us. We're super excited to see you. The other thing that's going on is starting on Wednesday, July the 8th, we're gonna be hearing from Tanisha Baker. Tanisha is an educator and advocate. She's a phenomenal leader in our community, and we're gonna be talking about race and privilege with her. We're gonna have three sessions at noon on Wednesdays, and then on Wednesday, July the 29th, we're gonna have the chance to get on a Zoom call with her and talk about what her experience has been like, what we can do no matter our race to make sure that our relationships are strong and our community is stronger. We hope you'll join us for that. There'll be a link to register for our Love Knoxville neighboring experience in the comments. We really appreciate you being with us. Thank you for all that you're doing to make sure that ministry continues to happen at Cooksbury Church. We love you and we'll see you soon. Show me a face, fill up this space, my world needs you right now, my world needs you right now, I can't escape being afraid, fill me with you. My world needs you right now. Show me your face. Fill up this space. My world needs you right now. My world needs you right now. I can't escape.
Hey guys, welcome to Cokesbury Church this weekend. I want to say thanks to Paul um, for letting us come down to his studio. It's great to kind of not just stretch the legs, but to actually get to stretch the soul a little bit. I know that we could all use that. I'm glad that you guys are joining us. So from wherever you're tuning in, I'm really glad you're taking time out of your schedule to be here. We're in this series where we're talking about valleys and how easy it is to look at life and think, well, wow, I want those mountaintop experiences, right? I want the, the moments where my life goes exactly the way I want it to and my dreams all pan out and everything goes great. We love those moments. But where we really, I think, learn life's lessons is when we find ourselves down in the valley. And listen, I know because we've been talking about this for a few weeks now. It's no fun to be in the valley. And most of us don't plan on being there. But what I'm trying to communicate is that when we do find ourselves in the valley, that is a great time for us to experience God. In fact, I would argue that that's the moment we learn the most about ourselves. And it's certainly true that we learn more about God when life's not going the way we want it to than we do when everything's going exactly to plan. And so today we're going to be in the Valley of Dry Bones. I've been thinking this week, my life is no different than yours. It's a series of events, and there are some events that you think about, and they sort of burn themselves into your psyche, and it's, you can remember every detail of every moment. I was an athlete in high school, and when my high school career ended, I was trying to chase after that Friday night feeling, and I know a lot of you guys can have experienced that as well. In fact, some of us will chase that feeling the rest of our lives. And so when I went to college, and organized sports were over, I had a friend that got me into bike racing. And so if you've ever been here in Knoxville and seen the U.S. Cycling Championships, that's sort of the thing I did um, all throughout college. And I know every time I start talking about this moment in my life, people are like, well, Stephen, I can look at you and know you didn't do that. So I've actually got proof of what I used to look like back in the early 90s. This is a picture of Beth and I on our wedding day, and um, I weighed 170 pounds right there, right? So like I was in shape, and this was about six months um, after the story I want to share with you right now. But um, what's great about that picture is that in a, a little over two months, I'm going to be married to that woman for 28 years. And so I just want to say in case she's watching, Beth, I love you, and I'm glad you're a part of my life. So I was racing bicycles, and we were in Chattanooga. And this particular road race took us up and across and then back down four mountains in the Chattanooga area. And it had been a very long, hot day, and we were coming down the final mountain. And so I knew we were getting close to the finish line, right? And so as we're careening down the mountain, we come into a hairpin turn, and that was one of the darkest moments of my entire life. Because as I made the apex of that turn, my front tire on my bicycle blew out, and I hit the deck. Now y'all, listen, I'm almost six feet, five inches tall. And even at 170 pounds, that impact was unbelievable. 50 miles an hour. Well, as you might imagine, when you hit pavement at 50 miles an hour, whatever skin's touching the pavement's gone, right? So I was scraped literally from the outside of my, um, outside of my foot all the way up to my side, um, even had road rash on the side of my face. And I hit so hard that it broke my helmet. Now, the worst part of that whole experience when I stopped was, listen, this is before cell phones, okay? Not many people had them. So when you're in a situation like that, you've got to wait on somebody that's ahead of you to tell somebody that you're hurt. And so I'm sitting on the side of the road. And the thing I remember the most is I was struggling to breathe. And the more I struggled to breathe, the harder my head started to hurt. And I sat there on the side of that mountain for what seemed like forever, although I think it was probably just a few minutes. 
Eventually, an ambulance came and uh, the paramedics got out and they discovered that I had a couple of broken ribs in addition to all the other wounds. But I kept telling them about this headache and so they did something that's only happened that one time in my life. They put oxygen on my face. And literally, y'all, within a couple of deep breaths, my headache actually went away. Now, why am I telling you that story? Well, that's what I've been praying for you guys. This is not a message. This is an actual prayer that I've been praying over everyone who claims Cokesbury is home over the past three months. I'm literally asking that God will open up a can of pure oxygen and fill your lungs, literally fill your life with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm praying that God will cure a few headaches because I know most of us, we've got some headaches in our life. In fact, you can pray this prayer right now. It's just three simple words and listen, doesn't matter where you are. It's just three words, come Holy Spirit. In fact, let's take it a step further. Why don't we all do this together, right? Because you're probably not in a situation where there's a lot of people watching what you do. So you can pray, come Holy Spirit, but then here's what I want you to do. Just take a deep breath, bring it in and let it out. Maybe you want to do that again, right? Because maybe it's been a while since you've taken a deep breath. Just breathe in and breathe out. Wherever you're watching from, whether it's in your living room, maybe you're sitting at your kitchen table, maybe you're out on the back porch, maybe you're listening live, maybe you're driving down the road, right? Maybe you're catching this message later in the week when it's more convenient. Just take that deep breath and let it out. Doesn't that feel good? When you take a deep breath, it has a biological effect, and I'm not making this stuff up. You can fact check me right now. It causes the blood to flow to the rest of our body just simply when we take in that breath and let it out. It has a physiological effect, right? Like science has found that it calms the nerves and it alleviates anxiety. It enhances our atten attention span and it even relieves pain. <clears throat> now here's what's awesome. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit calms our nerves. This is where our holy confidence comes from. The Holy Spirit alleviates our anxiety. He is the peace that surpasses all understanding. The Holy Spirit even enhances our attention span way beyond what we could ever ask for or even imagine. And believe it or not, the Holy Spirit can relieve our pain. He is our counselor. He is our comforter. He's an ever-present help in time of need. And if you're following Jesus, I just want to remind you that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead actually dwells inside of you. And by the way, long before you even woke up this morning and long after you go to sleep tonight, the spirit of God is interceding for you with groanings that can't even be formulated into words. Now, come on, everybody. That ought to relieve a few headaches, right? You're not alone. It's not all on your shoulders. You've got an advocate and a helper. God himself is in your corner. Now, this weekend, we're venturing into the Valley of Dry Bones. If you have a Bible or you want to pop open another browser, it's going to be in Ezekiel chapter 37. And while you're finding your way there, let me kind of set the scene. The book of Ezekiel was written around 571 BC, and it's specifically focused on the Jewish refugees who are living in a place called Babylon. A few years before this moment, the Babylonians had conquered the city of Jerusalem and they had um, pilfered the temple, right? The most sacred place of the Jewish faith. And essentially they had profaned everything that the people of Israel called holy. So Ezekiel comes and he's writing to people who feel like God has completely abandoned them. Now let's be honest. Most of us can relate to that, right? I mean, I've been there and I bet you have too. But here's the irony. Sometimes when we feel like God has turned his back on us, it's because we've turned our back on God. We go our own way and then we wonder where God went. And the truth of the matter is God didn't really go anywhere. 
His goodness and mercy is following you all the days of your life. And if you would just turn around, you would find that God is waiting for you with arms wide open. That's part of what makes being human so beautiful. That God in his infinite wisdom, and I would argue his profound grace created us not to just be mindless drones, but we were beautifully and wonderfully made and we were given this thing called free will. We actually get to choose. Think about it. Every day you get to choose. Are you going to love or are you going to hate? Are we going to live for ourselves or are we going to live for other people? Are we going to speak words of grace or are we going to speak words of condemnation? Are we going to live with our fist clenched tightly, holding on to everything that we ever get in life? Or are we going to learn to live a life of generosity with hands wide open? You and I get to choose. Are we going to follow God or are we going to reject God? Are we going to do things the way we were designed to do them? Or are we going to continue to try to do things on our own? And when we step out of the life that God designed for us to live, it's not that God gets mad or God punishes us. It's just that God is a perfect gentleman. He honors the choice that you and I make. If we want to see what life looks like when we try to live it under our own power, God cares about us enough to let us experience that for ourselves. You get the full weight of it and you get to deal with the consequences. That's what's going on in our text. Long story short, the Jewish people had profaned God with their idolatry long before the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar pilfered the temple. And so God sends them this eccentric prophet named Ezekiel. And when I say eccentric, y'all, I mean one time this dude actually preached a sermon while lying on his side for 390 days. Think about that. One sermon, 390 days. And sometimes y'all give me stuff about going too long on the weekends. If you're not familiar with Ezekiel, he's one of the major prophets. And I'll be honest with you guys. The first 24 chapters are a really tough read. Ezekiel is basically rebuking the Jewish people. But I'll say this. We don't need false prophets, especially right now, who say what our itching ears want to hear. I don't know about you, but the people that I appreciate the most And the people that I have the most respect for are the people that will actually speak truth into my life. I don't need more people telling me what I want to hear. Sometimes you just need somebody who loves you enough to tell you the actual truth. And the key there is actually love. This is not about being a bull in the china shop. It's got to come from an actual spirit of love. If love is absent, then really all you're doing is just being a jerk. And nobody likes to be around jerks. And by the way, the more that you care about what people think about you, the less you're able to love them. But the less you care about what people think about you, the more you're able to actually love them. Hope that makes sense. Now, about halfway through the book, it's almost as if Ezekiel kind of flips the page, right? He goes from a rebuke, and listen, his name literally means God strengthens. And so about halfway through, he starts actually living up to that name. He confronts them with the brutal truth, and then he starts speaking life, and he starts speaking love, and he starts offering hope. And beyond hope, he starts giving them a way to find help. And that's where we pick up the story in Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, let me back the bus up just a little bit. I want to give us an on-ramp into the Valley of Dry Bones. I want to begin in the mountains back in chapter 36. The Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. And he says this several times in chapter 36. Now, let me state the obvious. God tells Ezekiel to begin to prophesy to an inanimate object. Generally speaking, people who talk to inanimate objects end up sitting by themselves, right? They don't have a whole lot of friends because that's not normal. But what we're going to learn today is that normal can sometimes be overrated. At some point in your life and my life, if we're going to break a bad habit, if we're going to overcome an addiction, if we're going to achieve a goal that we set, if we're going to restore a relationship, if we're going to solve whatever problem it is 
that you and I find ourselves facing at some point, we've got to stop talking to God about our mountains and we've got to start talking to our mountains about God. You have to prophesy his promises. You got to prophesy his power and his love and his grace and his truth. Jesus said it this way. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. In other words, faith is what turns mountains into molehills. Now, I love this story in the Gospels. When this storm hits the Sea of Galilee and the disciples find themselves scared to death, which is a huge thing because most of these guys had spent more than half of their lives out on the open seas. You remember that story? You remember what Jesus does? He stands up in the boat, which would have been a tremendous feat in and of itself. And he rebukes the storm with three simple words. He speaks to the storm, peace be still. Now the disciples had seen him perform a lot of miracles. But for some reason, this one blew their minds. I wonder if sometimes the hardest thing to believe God for is in an area where we feel like we have expertise. Why? Because that's the place where we feel self-sufficient. That's the place where we think we've got everything figured out. That's the place where we feel like we've got things most under control. The more you know, sometimes the harder it is to unlearn some of those assumptions. I think for the disciples, that was the Sea of Galilee. For the disciples, this was their jaw-dropping moment. I love what they say. The scriptures tell us they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. See, the lesson is in Christ, you can tell mountains to move. In Christ, you've got the ability to tell storms to be still. You've been given that kind of authority. Jesus said, whatever you bind up on earth will be bound in heaven. Now, let me be clear. This is not a name it and claim it kind of deal. This is not about getting God on our agenda and it's not about getting God to operate on our timetable. It's gotta be in the will of God and it's gotta be for the glory of God. All right, verse eight says this, but you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel. God promises fruitfulness where there's barrenness. Now, let me say this. If you want God to do the super, then you got to be willing to do the natural. I think one of the most fascinating miracles in the Gospels is Jesus cursing the barren fig tree. In every other miracle that Jesus performs, that miracle always brings life. But in this miracle, it brings death. Think about it. What is a barren fig tree? It's anything that isn't producing fruit. Now think about the last three months. I think if you and I could be honest with ourselves, most if not all of us have had some barren fig trees during this COVID-19 crisis. There are some things maybe that you put down that you don't need to pick back up. Sometimes we've got to curse the barren fig tree. We got to we got to learn to participate in what God is doing. That's part of what makes following Jesus so awesome. We get to be on the front lines and watch God and participate with God. God doesn't just want to do a work in our lives. God wants to work through our lives. This promise of Ezekiel reminds me of the prophet Joel who said, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have stolen. It reminds me of the prophet Jeremiah where God says, I know the plans I have for you plans to profit you. It reminds me of the words of the prophet Zephaniah who said, for every trouble I will render double. It's even a reflection of what Paul wrote to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where he writes, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. There are roughly 5,000 promises in the scripture. And Paul says, all of them are a yes in Christ. But the verse doesn't end there. Check this out. It says, through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. That means you and I got to add the amen. How do we do that? By exercising our faith. Well, how do we do that? (laughs) 
by telling mountains to move and by telling the storm to be still and by telling water to turn into wine and by telling Lazarus to come forth. In math, this would be called the transitive property, which means if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And in this equation, C is Christ. See, in Christ, you and I have been grafted into covenant relationship with God, and we gain access to every single promise that God ever made to his people. Now, with that as the back setting, I want us to venture in to the Valley of Dry Bones. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 says this. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of dry bones. Verse 3. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, only you know. He said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now Ezekiel's already prophesied to the mountains. And now God's telling him to prophesy to dead bones. And I don't know which would be more impossible. Mountains are like huge, right? But dead bones are dead. Question, what does he prophesy? He prophesied the word of the Lord. And this is critical. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even the divided soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, we don't just read the scriptures. We learn to let the scriptures read us. The same spirit that inspired the original writers can inspire us. How? Psalm 119, verse 25. The psalmist writes, Quicken me according to thy word. That word quicken in Hebrew means mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So when the Spirit quickens, it brings dead things back to life. As we read and pray and begin to meditate on God's Word, God starts this process of resurrecting our life. Isn't that the way life works? You and I live in a culture where we want a quick fix. We need an immediate resolution. And yet what God's telling Ezekiel is, you just got to focus on what I've been saying to you from the very beginning. Meditate on it. Think about it. Let it read your life. And over time, I'll resurrect your soul. See, God, through his word, performs surgery on our souls. Verse 5. He says through Ezekiel, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. There's this shaking and this trembling in rattling all of these bones. They start to come together and flesh comes upon them and skin starts to cover them, but there's still no breath in them. Then the Lord says, verse 9, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these dry bones. See, this is a flashback to the book of Genesis, where in the beginning God breathed into the dust and human beings took life. I think about the 23,000 breaths that you and I take on average every single day. In Judaism, the name of God was too sacred to actually be pronounced. In fact, it was spelled without vowels. Now, here's what's really cool. Some Hebrew scholars believe that the name of God, Yahweh, without the vowels, is synonymous with the sound of breathing. So check this out. If that's true, then the name of God is actually whispered 23,000 times every single day. It's our first word, and it's our last word, and it's every word in between. Verse 12, thus says the Lord, behold, I will open your grave and cause you to come up out of them. In verse 5, we get a flashback to creation. In verse 12, we get a fast forward to the resurrection. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus speaking to dead bones and saying, Lazarus, come forth. It's a picture of what Jesus does in every single one of us. Over time, pieces of our personality begin to die. 
And so do our dreams. And the enemy, we know, comes to steal and to kill and destroy. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Let me ask you a question. Would you like to receive life today? Would you like to have a dream resurrected? Would you like to go through the day knowing that you've got a lasting sense of hope? Would you like for that can of oxygen to be released into the depths of your soul? Would you like to get your life back? See, God's been saying throughout the ages, through prophets like Ezekiel, that not everything's going to go exactly the way you want it to go. But even in those moments when it feels like you're walking through the valley of dry bones, I'm the one that can breathe life back into them. I'm the one that can cause them to knit themselves back together. I'm the one that can resurrect what was once dead and bring it back to life again. Friends, see, that's the good news of the gospel. I know some of us are struggling right now. And I know some of us have got way more than a headache. And I know there are some of us that are struggling to the point that we're not even sure, can we go one more day? And I showed up this weekend to remind you that your life is not over until God says it's over. Your circumstance is not, does not get the final say in your life. And whatever mountain you might be facing right now, it may seem huge, but I'm telling you, our God is even bigger. And you and I have the ability right now, even though we may not know what tomorrow holds, we know what this day promises. And it promises that God is a good God that God loves us and cares for us, that God's got a plan for your life and my life. And even when we cannot see the outcome, God's already written the ending to our story. And so today, all you got to do is focus on this day. Find a way to give God a little bit of praise. Find a situation where even if you've got to pull back from yourself and just pump the brakes and get quiet for five seconds and be reminded that the God of the universe cares so much, not just about the world, but about you, that he laid down his life to prove that you're worth something, that you matter, that there's a plan and a purpose for your life, and that even in the midst of great tragedy, you can go through life with your chin up and your chest sticking out. Oh, I long for the people of Cokesbury Church to be the kind of people who aren't afraid to look at what seems dead, to do what we can to allow God to breathe life back into it, so that you and I can stand and we can give God the glory and the world will see how awesome our God really is. I want you to know I'm praying for you guys. I'm praying that this week that God will relieve some headaches. I'm praying that right now as you're watching this, that God's spirit will continue to stir in your soul. I'm praying that somebody will find the strength to take their next step. And I'm praying that over the next seven days, before we see each other again, that God will open up a door and that we'll have the courage to step through it so that we'll be able to gather together again next week and know without a certainty that God is on the move, that God has not forgotten his people, and that God's grace and God's mercy is ultimately going to change the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Oh